Welcome back everyone. Now we've been on vacation, so today we're gonna hit the ground running with a killer whale known as Lolita, or as the First Nations know her, Tokite. Now before I say rest in peace to my comment section, I wanna be very clear right out the gate. Lolita's situation is unacceptable. I'll take a deeper dive into that in a moment, but I have actually personally seen this exhibit and the animal in it, and I believe that this situation is horrible. Miami Seaquarium's exhibit is not up to my standards, and it shouldn't be up to anyone's standards. And I think that everyone has agreed that something should be done. But what? What can be done, logistically and even legally? I'm KP, a marine biologist with over a decade's worth of experience working with marine mammals. Something else I want to be upfront about is that, contrary to my comment section, I do not, nor have I ever, worked for SeaWorld or Miami Seaquarium. And Miami Seaquarium is where Tokite has been housed for nearly 60 years. That's right, Lolita is a very old killer whale. In fact, she is the second oldest killer whale under human care currently. And in 2017, the USDA found that her exhibit does not meet the federal size requirements by law. This is just one of the reasons why she has been the subject of documentaries, protests, and even lawsuits calling for her release. Which brings us to one of what I think is the biggest misconceptions about zoos and aquariums. Miami Sea Aquarium does not actually have the power to release Lolita. Even if Miami Sea Aquarium did want to release Lolita, they absolutely could not do that legally without permits and approval of government agencies like the NOAA, the US Department of Wildlife, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. These permits are actually extremely difficult to obtain and several parameters and guidelines need to be met. I've posted links to the criteria and the guidelines that these agencies use to determine who does and doesn't get a permit for various things. You can find that in the descriptions down below, as well as a link to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which actually forms the legal foundation for all of these parameters. With that out of the way, I think the first thing to understand when releasing animals to the wild is the priorities of these government agencies. While public attention is often drawn to specific animals, individuals like Lolita, the government exclusively prioritizes the health of wild populations. In fact, the number one factor in determining whether or not an animal can be released is the release candidate must not pose risks to wild populations, their environment, or public safety. And this is especially relevant in Lolita or Tokite's case because she is part of the southern resident population of killer whales. I talk a bit more about the southern resident population in my video about SeaWorld's breeding program, and you can check that out right up here. In the wild, the southern resident ecotype is critically endangered. There are only about 74 individuals left. The primary risk of releasing a captive animal into a wild population is the introduction of a pathogen. For example, influenza B was originally thought to be a strictly human disease, but it is currently ravaging the seal population living off the Dutch coast, and it's believed that this virus was introduced via captive seals that were released into wild populations. There's a reason that you often see me wearing a mask when working with animals like this stellar sea lion or this African penguin. Because some of these animals can catch viruses like the flu, or as we've learned in the past couple of years, some of them can even catch COVID-19. In fact, my three ferrets were recently sick with a coronavirus. Thankfully, they're all feeling much better now. But if something like that happened with the critically endangered southern resident killer whales, they could easily go extinct. The southern resident orca population with only a little over 70 individuals remaining is not healthy enough to withstand the introduction of a novel pathogen. And that, in my opinion, would be an inexcusable ecological disaster. And yes, even animals held in sea pens are a risk to introducing pathogens to wild populations. Sea pens are captivity by a different name. Not only can they introduce pathogens to wild populations, but they damage ecosystems and expose the animals to uncontrolled pollutants. Which is just one of the many reasons that I am firmly against sea pens. 
but that's probably a topic for another video. Now, another obstacle for Lolita's release is her advanced age, because another important criteria in determining a release candidate is the release cannot pose serious risks to the candidate's welfare. Reintroducing Lolita to the Southern resident populations would take years and would be extremely stressful on her. And many experts and advocates such as the UBC Marine Mammal Research Unit have stated that reintroducing Lolita to the ocean at her age and after 50 plus years living under human care would be unethical and likely a death sentence. Not to mention that no killer whale held in captivity for an extended period of time has ever been successfully released to the wild. It has been tried, most famously with Keiko, the killer whale who played Free Willy. The attempt took over four years just to even try to get Keiko into shape and it cost over $20 million. And it failed. A scientific study critical of Keiko's botched release states, Keiko never integrated with wild pods and could not break his need for human contact. He sought out humans to interact with and even let children ride on his back post-release. There were no recorded instances of him feeding himself. Even after he was freed, he was still being fed by his caretakers. And he died a slow, lonely death, likely from some sort of respiratory infection, a little over a year out in the ocean, never having integrated with wild killer whales. Also, the US and Canada did not approve of Keiko's release because they did not believe that it would be successful. Keiko had to be shipped to Iceland for this experiment, which the vast majority of experts believed to be a cruel failure. So there really isn't any reason to believe that the NOAA or the DFO would change their minds and in this situation approve a release of a killer whale in US and Canadian waters. Not to mention that those requirements I've mentioned specify that marine mammals are non-releasable if they have been in captivity for more than two years. But if release isn't an option for Lolita, then what is? Well, in my opinion, the only thing to be done is to move her to a facility that better houses killer whales and has the opportunity for her to relate with conspecifics. A facility, hear me out, called SeaWorld. <laughs> Shit. And for those of you who disagree, don't worry because I have serious doubts that SeaWorld would even want to take her. These types of transports can be stressful, especially for an animal with advanced age. And if she died during transport or even once arriving at the facility, SeaWorld would almost certainly be blamed and they've had enough bad publicity. So if Lolita can't be released and she likely won't be transferred to another facility, then what are we going to do? And we have all already agreed since the top of this video that something should be done. The truth is, I don't know. If SeaWorld won't take her, I don't know what can be done. So for now, she is at Miami Seaquarium. She is supposedly in good health and no longer on public display or engaged in exhibitions. Even though we all disagree with the situation that she's been in for almost 60 years, it is everything that she knows and everything that she is comfortable with. I know that's not what everyone wants to hear, myself included, but there is some good news and it's buried in the research on Keiko's failed release. The lead author said, you can't just let these animals out into the wild. You have to take responsibility. That costs a lot of money. The fortune spent on Keiko might have been better invested in conservation programs to protect whales and their habitat. But that's not as appealing as the adventures of a single whale. The highlight of this quote for me is investing in conservation programs to protect whales and their habitat. Because as I've mentioned, Southern resident killer whales are on the brink of extinction, but there are conservation programs that are trying to protect them. And if you're interested in taking an active role in participating in those programs, click on the link right up here. It is the NOAA Fisheries Killer Whale Program. There, you'll find a path to recovery that is rooted in science. Things like habitat restoration, noise and disturbance reductions, and even links to local watershed groups that are restoring vital streams where Chinook salmon spawn and estuaries 
that provide nurseries for young fish that killer whales depend on for food. Because while there might not be anything that we can currently do for Lolita, there is a lot that we can do for the southern resident killer whale population that she comes from that is struggling to survive in the wild. And that is the main purpose of accredited facilities. Animals living under human care, whether they are killer whales, sea lions, sea otters, these animals are ambassadors for their species. Seeing them should inspire you to care about their wild cousins and take an active role in conservation of the ocean and all of its species. Cheers. In fact, my three ferrets were recently sick with a coronavirus. Look at the camera. Let's look at the plant. <laughs> Don't look at the plant, look at the camera. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, my three ferrets were recently sick with a coronavirus. Am I not being condescending? I feel like I'm not being condescending. Am I being a little condescending? It's okay. It's, it looks good. I feel like it's just educational. It's different. Right. There's a reason that you often see me wearing a mask when working with animals like this stellar sea lion. <laughs>